Everyone, welcome to the Topology Optimization Webinar. Today is our 25th session, and it is kindly organized by Professor Peter Downing from the University of Aberdeen in the UK. Peter, thank you for organizing this session. Please take it over. Uh, thanks, Jen. Um, so a couple of quick announcements first. So the first talk will be presented by Da Gang, who is the first author on the first paper, rather than uh, Professor Ming Dong Zhou. And unfortunately, the third speaker, Professor Rafael Palacios, has had a family emergency, has had to pull out at the last minute. We, we wish him and his family well, and we hope that perhaps he can present at a future webinar. So we only have um, four speakers, but I'm really looking forward to, to all four talks. As the brief given to me by the organizers, it's quite eclectic. There's no particular theme. We're looking at different types of physics. We're looking at fundamental development of methods, application of topology optimization, um, and uh, yeah, a wide range of, of things. So hopefully there'll be a bit in there to interest everybody here. So without any more from me, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, who is Da Gang from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, um, who is a PhD student working with, as I said, Professor Ming Dong Zhou. And he's going to talk about using multi-scale topology optimization to design cooling channels. So, Da Gang, if you can share your screen. Okay. okay. So whilst he's doing that, because we only have four presenters rather than five, we can be a little bit more flexible with time. So the idea is the presenters will give a summary of a recent paper, and then there'll be some uh, time afterwards for questions. And then we'll have some time at the end of the webinar for a general discussion and any further questions you may have. Again, are you ready? Uh, please wait, please, uh, please wait, please wait. Hmm? Uh, the okay. screen and video no more? Yep, it looks okay to me. So, uh, how do you get uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dagen. Uh, um, I'm, I'm a PhD student in Shanghai Jiao Tong University. My advisor is Professor Ming Dong Zhou. Uh, the topic uh, of my report uh, is uh, concurrent topology optimization of multi scale cooling channels with uh, inlets and uh, outlets. <clears throat> Liquid channels are needed in engineering products to maintain the system working in a proper temperature range. Uh, it is possible to future improve the cooling performance of channels by increasing the surface area to volume radio through other channel forms such as uh, multi-scale channels or uh, uh, optimize the uh, distributions of inlets and uh, um, outlets. Uh, as a simulation-driven design approach, some fluidic topology optimization uh, can be employed to design cooling channels that allow for excellent uh, performance. Some works uh, have used the high fidelity fluid models to describe the fluid flow in multi school channels and uh, doing uh, topology optimization. Uh, these uh, high fidelity simulations are often computationally Hi. complex. Dagen, are you still with us? What? Jen, I can hear that gang fine. Oh. <clears throat> uh, and the efficiency of the corresponding optimization uh, iteration is low. If low fidelity through the model is used, the, the bulk problem may, may be avoided. Uh, Professor Zhou and uh, others proposed the performance topology optimization of uh, cooling channels. Uh, in this method, the, the dust flow model as used to replace the turbulence model to simulate the fluids for, for achieving efficient iterations. Uh, the, the, uh, this method has been attended to 3D heat sinks in natural convection and load bearing battery packets. 
Uh, it has uh, recently been integrated into Altair OptiDrug uh, topology optim optimization uh, software. Progress works only focus on monoscale cooling channels with, fi with fixed uh, inlets and outlets, uh, but fail to improve performance from the multi scale and the distribution of inlets and outlets. Uh, based, on, uh, based on the above, uh, uh, research background is work extends the topology optimization uh, a method based on the DASI model to concurrent design of multi scale channels, inlets, and outlets. Uh, in this figure, the black color represents the uh, fluid, which consists of main channels with and a large number of micro channels. Uh, the coolant uh, flows into the main channels through the Inlets and is dispersed in micro channels. After sufficient heat transfer, the coolant is collected in the main channels and flows out through the uh, outlet. It can be seen that the multi scale channels contain a lot of tiny features. To build the low iteration efficiency due to a large number of finite elements, the numerical homogenization is used to predict the equivalent properties of the micro channel unit cell. However, uh, if the efficient uh, properties of micro channels are predicted during topology optimization, the calculation amount is still large. To future accelerate the inter iteration, uh, we predefined uh, uh, the topology of, uh, uh, of unit cell uh, and uh, define a control parameter uh, to represent the full the volume fraction in micro, uh, in micro channels. By varying the variable in optimization process, pertinent to unit cell for heat transfer can be realized at proper regions, including the homogeneous solid and fluid. Next, we established the sergeant models that reflect the relationship of constructed microfluidic equivalent properties with respect, with respect to unit cell control parameters. Uh, based on above uh, uh, sergeant uh, models uh, and the meaning of effective uh, permeability, the fluid flow in micro channels can be described by the Darcy model on the microscope. In this figure, a uh, black and white represent the homogeneous uh, fluid and the solid represent uh, respectively, and gray a gray color represent uh, uh, micro channels. According to the Darcy flow model. The equivalent velocity field uh, uh, can be quickly solved, uh, and uh, the heat transfer model can be uh, established to solve the temperature field. Um, since uh, the sergeant model directly reflects uh, the relationship between micro channel and their uh, effective properties, the bulb fitted as a bulb sergeant model are uh, directly used as inter uh, interpolation formulations. In addition, the boundary-based penalty, the boundary-based penalty uh, method is used to maintain uh, the inlet temperature, uh, inlet pressure, and outlet pressure to the specified boundary conditions. And this and this design-dependent penalty parameter enable uh, continuous layout optimization of inlets and outlets. Uh, based on the above. Uh, uh, interpolation formulation uh, formulations, the topology optimization model uh, can be established as follows. The design variable is uh, micro channel control parameters. The objective uh, objective function objective function is uh, uh, is to minimize mean temperature or target domain, and the uh, constraint include. Uh, uh, for the volume constraint, the inlet and the outlet volume constraint. Uh, to prove the advantage of the proposed method, a uh, rectangular domain uh, with uh, uniform um, distributed uh, heat transfer will be designed as follows. The heat source are distributed in, in the orange area. The left boundary is the inlet boundary and the right boundary is the outlet boundary. This is the uh, optimization parameter. Uh, 
I lost uh, any audio. How is that for others? Same here, no audio for me. Yes, unfortunately, it looks like his, his connection has dropped. Um, Dagen, can you hear us? Um, because we can't hear you, so it looks like your connection might have uh, cut out. Maybe he can't hear us. Okay. I'm not sure what the, the solution is, but maybe to leave and come back. We may consider the next presenter and then Doug can continue later on. Dagen, can you try and uh, speak? I don't know. No, it still doesn't work. Dagen, if you can hear us, please um, try and, and leave the meeting and rejoin. Okay, yeah, so we'll just give him a few. Luckily, well, um, we're not compressed for time. <laughs> so we'll give him one attempt to see if he can come back and uh, carry on. I think he was close towards the end of his presentation. It's going to show us some results. Again, can you hear us? Can you try and speak? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, no problem. These okay, things happen. Yeah. These things happen. Okay, we can see you now. So uh, you were uh, just you were just um, starting to talk about your results. Uh, okay. um, if you can try and continue and see if we can uh, if we drop okay, up okay, again okay. we'll we'll go to the next speaker um, uh, oh. and, and try and get you back at the end but let's as you're back now let's try and uh carry on yeah so i think this is the the point where you started to cut out Okay, uh, now I continue. Yes, please. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, the channels are designed by the modern scale topology optimization method. The left side uh, is a channel designed with, uh, with uh, uh, fixed inlets and outlets. The right side is a concurrent design of channels, inlets, and outlets. All displayed results are for uh, are the uh, reconstructed design. The uh, the simulation results are calculated by the business model. Uh, 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 we can see the uh, mean uh, the mean and maximum temperature. Uh, the pressure, uh, the pressure drop of channel design with fixed inlet and outlet are higher than that of the concurrent design of channels, inlets, and outlets. Uh, it indicates that uh, the concurrent design of monoscale channels, inlets, and outlets with both, uh, with better cooling performance and a lower pumping pressure can be obtained. The superiority of the concurrent design lies in addition design free, uh, free terms from the position of the inlets and outlets. Uh, second, uh, we compared uh, monoscale design of channels, uh, of uh, channels, inlets, and outlets, and the multi-scale design of uh, channels, inlets, and outlets. Compared with the multi-scale design of uh, uh, channels, inlets, and outlets, the cooling performance indicators of monoscale design 
um, uh, in CFD simulations are higher under same pumping pressure. Uh, the temperature difference between the maximum and the mean uh, temperature is uh, 69 K, where a lot of difference uh, uh, 40 K is observed for the multiple design, indicating that the latter is happy to um, uh, more uniform temperature distributions. Uh, the superiority of the multi-school uh, channels lies in larger design uh, freedom from the distribution of the uh, microstructures. Uh, compared the, compared the, uh, the cooling performance indicators and the pressure drop of different de uh, designs, we can find that uh, the optimized uh, multi-school uh, multi channels it have the better cooling performance compared to the multi-school cooling channels with the same or lower pressure drop. The superiority of the multi-skill design lies in distributions of the inlets and outlets and the larger design freedom from the distribution of micro-channels. Um, according to the above research, the following conclusions can be obtained. Uh, in this work, we propose the concurrent topology optimization approach to design multi-skill uh, fluid channels, inlets, and outlets for efficient cooling capability. The proposed methods enable multi-skill channels to match complex temperature fields point by point for sufficient and uniform heat transfer. Uh, this work focuses on the cooling capabilities of the uh, 2D um, channels, but the proposed uh, method can be easily extended to 3D multi-skill channel design. Uh, this work has published on um, SMO. <coughs> uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dagang. So now we have a few minutes for questions. Mm. Um, Ole, you have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering, could you go to slide 11? The next slide. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, can you can you go to the next slide, slide number eleven? Number eleven. Okay. Uh, this one. Yes. So I was wondering the result for the multi-scale design uh, was that computed on the homogenization grid or was it actually reconstructed with a very fine mesh? Uh. Mm. Uh, in this uh, in this picture, oh, okay. Uh, in this uh, in this picture, um, every gray element uh, represents uh, a micro channel unit cell, uh, like this one. So uh, we uh, after optimization, we got uh, we got a uh, uh, gray a uh, gray uh, 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 consists of uh, consider a lot of gray gray <laughs> element. Uh, and we 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 trans uh, we 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 reconstruct uh, the uh, four skill design like this. Okay, so I was just curious because you have so tiny channels that I would expect a very large pressure drop compared to the one at left. Uh, I'm just yeah, sort of physically it doesn't fully make sense to me, but but it may be right. Mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, uh. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just curious why the pressure drop is the same between the structure to the left and to the right, because you have such narrow channels to the right. And I think the pressure drop doesn't just linearly depend on the channel width, right? But uh, I, maybe I, I can consult the paper also. Or... I'm so sorry. Uh, my, my English is not good. So I, I can't, I can't uh, fully understand your means. Oh. I'm so sorry. Maybe I will send you a mail afterwards. But thank you. It looks very interesting. So, Ahmad, you have your hand up as well? Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. So, uh, did you see any instability in the analysis of uh, 
your fluid because of the convection term in high flow rate if you if you run your simulation for different flow rate uh, because of you have a lot of tiny micro channels and yes. they are forming in the different shape because of the convection term it's expected you have some instability so and maybe you need to use a, a, some stabilizer but that was again like only ask it was my curiousness to see what is the size of this channel what is the flow rate and how your confidence about your solver your analysis not op optimization but anyway so i can um, i can send you email i will uh, try to look at the e uh, the information i will send you email through the email my uh -huh. question so, but okay. thank you. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh -huh. uh, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's my email. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? You can either raise your hand or if you want to type your question, I can read that out to the presenter. Um, but if there are no more questions for now, then we should thank Da Geng for his presentation. Uh -huh. And uh, invite our next speaker. So Mehdi, if you can share your screen. Um, if you think of questions as we're going along afterwards, there will be some time at the end. So I'd like to invite our next speaker, Professor Mehdi Tavakoli from Sherrod University Technology in Iran. And he's gonna talk about um, a new approach for combining isogeometric analysis and level set based Topology optimization. So, uh, Mehdi, when you're ready. Um, I can't hear you, Mehdi. Yeah, do you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Peter, for inviting me. Uh, and also thanks to uh, the organizers of the talk webinar. Uh, in this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about isogeometric levels of topology optimization by using a parameter space approach. And uh, the first author is uh, my former PhD student, Masoud Aminzadeh. Uh, first, let me uh, briefly uh, explain the isogeometric, some features of isogeometric analysis that uh, might be useful uh, to present uh, the purpose method. Uh, in general, in isogeometric analysis, uh, BSP lines are used to create solution surface for um, uh, governing um, partial differential equations of engineering problems. In a BSP line surface, as you can see here, um, a BSP line surface can be defined by uh, products of BSP line basis functions in R and S direction time to, times two uh, uh, corresponding control net. And the BSP line basis functions are constructed recursively um, and based on two not vectors R and S in two directions by R and S. Uh, these two not vectors span a space which is called not span, which is called parameter space. You can see parameter space here, and also uh, you can see um, the surface and the control points and control mesh, which connects these control points to each other, uh, or control net are shown in this figure. More advanced versions uh, of these lines uh, are called NERVs, which are weighted and also rational, as you see in this equation. Uh, in isogeometric analysis of structures, both geometry and displacements are defined by nerve basis functions over the parameter space. Uh, X uh, denotes the geometry and U uh, describes the um, unknown function displacement uh, that both uh, are uh, defined or approximated by um, uh, nerve basis functions. Every span between uh, two uh, not uh, member or entries of knot vectors is called a knot element 
and there is a corresponding area in physical space for each knot element. The integration is also performed by, uh, in all, over the parent element, and we have a mapping here between parent uh, element and knot element uh, in this um, approach. System of equilibrium equations for each knot element is simply derived by using the virtual work principle, as it is the case in finite element method, and by substituting constitutive equation and the relationship between strain and displacement, uh, we end up with the system of equation KU equals F. Uh, it is important to note that U here is not is 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 the vector of position of contour points of the solution surface is not exactly the, the displacement vector, and K is the coefficient matrix. Uh, when we are going to use isogeometric analysis in uh, level set topology optimization, two approaches might be considered. Um, first of all, because uh, the uh, BSP lines are um, flexible and robust uh, to make geometry. So uh, this comes to our mind that BSP lines are good and are a good candidate to uh, use for approximating the level set functions. So, uh, by doing so, uh, the control net is updated because we need to put the control points of the level set function to the level uh, to the level set equation, and the outcome would be the updated level set um, function control points. This brings uh, two drawbacks. The first, the discrepancy between. Uh, there is a discrepancy between uh, zero level of control net, and because the control net is updated. Uh, uh, and uh, the levels of surface itself. As you can see, it's simply uh, this figure shows uh, the control net and the, um, the curve itself. Uh, the discrepancy, you can see that points are different in zero level. And the second drawback is the control net of, of an analysis model and the grid for solving level set equation are dependent or are the same. It means that if we need to have a finer grid for solving level set equation, then we have to have a finer uh, control net of the un analysis model, which might increase the computational time. Two remedies for this approach uh, might be thought. Uh, first is to use the level set function itself in the Hamilton Jacobi equation to be solved. And uh, if we use uh, the level set function itself here in uh, on these steps of uh, in the level set procedure, we need to find the contour points after updating the boundaries uh, because we need these contour points for isogeometric analysis in the next step. So uh, we need to uh, solve an inverse problem. Which, is, which might be least square to find contour points in each iteration, which is time consuming and also brings approximation in our calculations. Uh, and the second remedy might be considering more contour points to decrease the discrepancy between the level set function and its control net. Uh, problems uh, made us think to interpolate the level set function by polynomials separately from the control net of on, on the on, on analysis model. And the first to achieve this in the first stage, the not elements in parameter space uh, are discretized into several regions in order to uh, have more accuracy. And then the level set is solved over the parameter space. Uh, any method can be used for um, solving level set equation. For example, we have chosen radial basis function and also reaction diffusion method for uh, which is used linear finite element uh, shape functions uh, because we need to guarantee that the uh, whole nucleation is achieved during the optimization um, process. Um, however, the finite difference method can be easily used. Uh, even for irregular domains, since the parameters, um, since the parameter space is always a, a unit square. Uh, and uh, at the last step, the obtained uh, topology is mapped into the physical space. Uh, and this is the method that is presented in this uh, paper. And two optimization 
problem in order to illustrate the the uh, the performance of the method. Two optimization problem are considered. The first is to minimize the strain energy uh, when certain amount of material is considered, and the second is weight minimization uh, under local stress constraint by doing sensitivity on by doing sensitivity on analysis. Uh, we end up with the uh, velocities as you see here. Uh, uh, there is a difference, a determinant of Jacobi we have here in comparison with um, other level set methods in literature, which is to control the velocity in parameter space. Uh, for uh, the beam compliance problem, a short uh, cantilever beam. Uh, with uh, under uh, is considered under point load at the end center, and uh, the results are uh, with uh, models with different number of counter points are shown here. The first row is to do with the uh, real basis function, and the second is for the reaction diffusion method. In our previous work, which in, in which the level set function was interpolated by BSV lines. We could not obtain good and, and appropriate solution for a smaller number of counter points. Uh, and uh, the presented the, 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 the proposed method uh, is able to um, actually handle or deal with the smaller uh, points uh, as you see here. But uh, the problem was that uh, if we decrease the number of counter points, uh, some wavy boundaries uh, can be appeared, might be appeared in our uh, results, final results. And uh, it might be interesting to see the discrepancy between the zero levels of the level set function itself and its control net in uh, different iterations uh, in 300 and, mm, 325 uh, control points model. As you see, there is a hole here in uh, the uh, the zero level of the control net in comparison with the level set function itself. And uh, uh, for the uh, stress problem, and the L-shaped beam is considered here or is modeled by 855 control points. Uh, the method is able to remove uh, the stress concentration from this point, and also the results is in good agreement with uh, literature as uh, compared in the paper and shown here. Uh, while we have a um, actually smaller number of counterpoints or smaller number of degree of freedoms in our problem, uh, and this was for me. Thank you for your attention, and I'm. Uh, available for any question. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Mehdi. So we have time as always for a, a few questions. So if anybody would like to ask a question, you can raise your hand or type in the chat. I uh, have a question. Yeah, Matthias. Yeah. So thank you for the, for the talk. Uh, I think maybe I missed a fundamental point, but uh, you you mentioned that there is a difference for the zero level set of the control net compared to the zero level set of the level set function. But I, I fail to understand why that is important because in my understanding, the control net is what you use to construct the level set function. And the level set function then defines the geometry and, and on that you evaluate uh, the physics. So why yeah. is it important that the control net uh, why should it have exactly the same uh, zero contour as the level set function? Yeah, in, uh, because in the hamilton jacob equation or the level set equation, we need to update the boundaries of the structure. So the boundaries of the structure are not uh, the zero, actually the zero uh, level of the control net because the control net is different from the, uh, the function itself. For example, in this curve, um, the 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 z zero level are points. For example, we have a we have a blue point here, but the zero uh, level of the control net uh, is here and here. So uh, there are uh, these this 
discrepancy between these two uh, is is actually the problem in solving level set equation because the level set equation needs to update the boundary of the structure, not the boundary of the structure which is uh, which is defined by the control net. Okay, this, that's this, maybe the essential part I missed. Uh, so thanks for pointing that out. So the, this, so I see you use the Hamilton Jacobi method to propagate uh, yeah, the level set to update it. If you would use the other way of directly using an optimizer to to basically update the control points, would it still be a problem? Uh, no, I think we can. For for example, in this paper, we have used. Uh, uh, reaction diffusion method. Let me bring it. Reaction diffusion method and radial basis functions. You mean that you know any other method like, for example, uh, SQP method or also, or no? I mean, keeping the keeping the NURBS or Bezier description of your level set function, but updating the control points using, for instance, MMA or another uh, gradient based optimizer. Instead of using the Hamilton Jacobi to update the design. Yes, yes. I think mm, it is doable, but I'm not sure about the results. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, I have one question myself, Mehdi. If you okay. go to page eight, eight, I think results, if I've written it down correctly. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to know that you've got these features here. So towards the where the loading point is, the boundary uh, seems to get kind of sucked towards the the boundary of the structure seems to get sucked towards the boundary of the domain um, in a yeah. way that perhaps is non-optimal. I wonder if you could explain why that happens. Is it the parameterization? Is it uh, the radial basis or the something like that? Uh, when we use, you mean if we use less number of control points as this 325 in comparison with 1,126? Yeah. yeah, it gets uh, better as you go from left to right here, but there's still a bit of the, the boundary yes. getting kind of sucked towards the, the domain edge. Yeah, I don't have the, 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 the final objective function for those now, but um, I think... Uh, yes, it might be uh, not op as optimum as those that have uh, 1,326 control points. But, but what, do you know why this happens? Is it to do with the parameterization uh, or, or something else? Um, I'm not sure about that because both radial basis function and reaction diffusion, um, uh, you know, results... Uh, this time, so I'm not sure it's because of the isogeometric analysis or because of the, the, the tuning parameters or the method that uh, uh, solves the level set equation. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Okay, there's one question in the chat, so we'll just do one question before moving on to the next speaker. Um, so it's a, a question from Emad says, thank you for the interesting presentation. I'd like to ask what polynomial degree is used for the analysis? Uh, yes, the and the BSV line actually degree is two for all examples that I have brought here. Okay. Okay, thanks for, for clearing that up. And of course, as always, Thanks. you can check out the paper for the full details. Um, so now I'd like to um, invite our third speaker. So many of you could stop sharing. Okay, yes. Yeah. And it is uh, Brett Stanford up next. For those of you who joined late, unfortunately, the advertised third speaker couldn't make it at short notice. Okay, so I'd like to welcome our, our third speaker for today, uh, Dr. Brett Stanford, who works in the aerolisticity branch at um, NASA Langley. 
and he's going to talk today about shape, sizing, and topology optimization of um, air elastic wing box. So over to you, Brett. Peter, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How about that laser pointer? Do you see that? Yep. Okay. Thanks All right. Thanks. Appreciate the invite. Uh, yes, yeah, so this will be a summary of a, um, a paper that we published in the AIAA Journal of Aircraft a year or two ago. As Peter said, this, this work is related to shape sizing and to topological design of, of air elastic structures. Um, so I'm on slide two now. Hopefully my slides are advancing across the internet. Um, I thought I'd belabor this point a little bit. Um, the, the, a key theme of our work is on air elasticity. And I think this is maybe not super familiar to some of the folks on the call here today. So I wanted to define this. Um, air elasticity is uh, basically a couple of interactions between aerodynamics and structures. So we have a, an airplane wing, which is subjected to aerodynamic loads. And um, it deforms in response to those loads. But when it deforms, its shape changes. And when the shape changes, um, the aerodynamics change and the loads change and so on. So we have this kind of give and take between the aero and the structure. Um, and so, so the end result here is that, you know, the loads on our structures are not known a priori. We have to compute them as a result of an aeroelastic process. Um, so this is the first idea I wanted to talk about. The second idea that I wanted to talk about, which again may not be super familiar to some of the folks on the call today, is, is a wing box structure. Uh, so I have a highly simplified uh, view of a wing box structure here, an exploded view, in fact. Um, what we have are upper and lower skin covers or upper and lower skin uh, panels. Uh, and, uh, and these bear the majority of the load um, during, during flight and during maneuver loads. Uh, and then we have these internal web members, um, which are the connective tissue between the upper and lower skins. And, and these, are, these are spars and, and ribs. Ribs are shown in red there. And then we also have skin stringers. Skin stringers are drawn in blue up against, you know, fastened up against the, uh, the, the, the covers. And the spars and the ribs and the stringers, they play various roles, but, but one of the big roles that they play is to ward off against skin buckling, right? Because we can, we can use these members to, to, to subdivide the covers up into smaller panels. And if the panels are smaller, then, then, then buckling is not gonna be as big of an issue. Uh, and so for our work, if we're interested in uh, topological design of wing box structures, meaning if we wanted to, to design the innards of a wing box, which we do, um, skin buckling is a huge player, uh, and, and we cannot ignore it uh, in, in our work. Uh, otherwise, we're not necessarily solving a particularly meaningful problem. So for topology optimization of a wing box, there's, there's, a, there's a, a good amount of literature out there um, uh, um, over the last 20 years, and I, I invite you to take a look on, uh, on the internet to kind of summarize that. Um, I think most of the papers that are out there can be, can be divided into one of three categories, which I have here. Um, the first one on the far left here is like a layout design problem, right? We, we know we want to have ribs and spars and stringers inside our wing box, and we want the optimizer to, to tell us, you know, where they should be, basically. Uh, and the second category is uh, optimizing in uh, lightning holes into those, some of those web members. And, and so these first two categories, you know, they can be done sequentially, if you like. First lay out the ribs and spars and then try to suck out even more material by optimizing in lightning holes. And then the third category here is a kind of a category unto itself. We just take our wing box and we fill it with, you know, tiny little voxels and we let the optimizer decide, you know, what the, what the topology should look like. Obviously, this is a big challenge to do that. Um, in all three of these cases, you know, skin buckling is a, is a key design driver. It's really got to be there if we want to solve meaningful problems. Um, the, the focus of my work that I'll present today is on this first category. So, so we know that we want to use, you know, ribs and, and spars and stringers inside the wing box, but, but we don't know how many we want or where they, should, where they should be oriented and how they should be connected. And maybe we want straight members, maybe we want curved members and so on and so forth. Right? So this is, this is a topology optimization problem that we want to solve. And furthermore, and I'm on slide five now, uh, furthermore, we want to solve that topological design problem alongside two different other types of um, parameterizations. The first being structural sizing and the second being uh, wing shape. So structural sizing would say, you know, I've got a skin panel or maybe I have a rib or, or whatever, and I want to find the optimal thickness of that of that panel and i want to find the optimal thickness of all the panels and i want to find the optimal height of the of the stiffeners and the optimal flange thickness and, and on and on right so we could have thousands if not tens of thousands of these structural sizing design variables um, the second category is wing shape so this would ask questions like uh, how long should the wing be how fat should it be how much sweep should there be taper camber twist should it be a a, a, a shallow wing box should it be a deep wing box and so on and so forth. So these would be wing shape variables. And then the final category is, is the topological uh, layout of, of the ribs and spars and stringers. Um, so the research questions that we were after in this paper um, were, were one, you know, how can we optimize all three of those design variable types at once? Um, so sizing and, and shape optimization, these are no big deal, right? So, so these are, we can, we can compute adjoint derivatives of sizing variables and shape variables. We can do gradient-based optimization. 
uh, the, the design space is nice and smooth. It appears to be uh, unimodal, though we have no way to prove that decisively, but we've never seen contrary, uh, we've never seen evidence to, to the contrary. Um, so if you just do sizing and shape design optimization, this is no big deal. People do it all the time. Um, the problem comes about when you have these topological layout design variables that you include, and, and, and there's a number of issues here. Some of those um, topological design variables are integers, right? Do I want five ribs? Do I want 12 ribs? And so on. Um, some of those topological variables are continuous, so like the orientation of a rib or the curvilinearity of, of a rib and so on, um, but the adjoint derivatives uh, are not easily computed, um, and even if we could compute them, the design space might be a little bit disjointed, right, as those components kind of slide around inside that wind box. Um, so if we want to do simultaneous shape, sizing, and layout design, um, that's going to leave us with a fairly large MINLP problem, right, mixed integer nonlinear programming problem, and these are very difficult problems to solve. This is the first thing, how can we solve it? And the second thing is what difference did it make if we did that, right? So are the design synergies between the three groups strong enough to even to even warrant the heavy lift, right? That we're gonna have to go through to solve that problem. So those, those are the two things that we wanted to demo um, in that paper. Um, the way that we solve the, the, the large MINLP problem is with um, uh, a nested optimization scheme. So we have a, a, an upper level and, and a lower level. On the upper level, we have a, a non-gradient based uh, global optimizer. Which only, satis which only solves for the topological design variables, which are the problem design variables. And then at the lower level, we have a, a dedicated uh, gradient-based optimizer, uh, a local optimizer, which we use to, to solve the sizing and, and the shape design variables, which are much easier to solve. Um, so every single time this global optimizer you know, identifies a new candidate and, and evaluates the response to that candidate, it has to drop down to this lower level and do a complete gradient-based optimization under the hood. Uh, so the computational cost here is going to be pretty high, right? Because this global optimizer might, um, you know, as it sort of hunts and pecks its way across that design space, might consider a hundred, maybe even a thousand different designs, uh, which means we have to do a hundred or maybe a thousand different complete gradient-based um, optimization. So the computational cost here is really high. Uh, everything's written in parallel, kind of nested levels of parallelism, but even still, the computational cost here is pretty large. Um, for the non-gradient-based global optimizer, we are using a surrogate-based optimization scheme with adaptive infilling. This is basically ego efficient global optimization that we have some additional tweaks that we've added in there that are uh, well suited for the problem at hand. I won't get into the, into the nitty gritty on that um, due to lack of time, but this is just what we're doing. It's a surrogate-based optimization with adaptive infilling. And then for the, for the, for the local optimizer at the gradient-based level, we're using uh, just GCMMA, right, which seems to work, which seems to work pretty well there. Um, the optimization problem that we were after is to try to find a, a Pareto front, an optimal trade-off, an optimal compromise between aerodynamic drag and structural weight. So we don't need to get into the details of, of why this is, but for, but for subsonic transport aircraft, which is what we're interested in, um, designs that are uh, aerodynamically optimum tend to be uh, heavy. And on the other side, designs that are structurally lightweight tend to be a little draggy. Right? So this is, this is the trade-off. Um, we actually, in our work, we don't quite look at drag versus weight. We more specifically look at, at metrics that are of greater interest to the aircraft industry. We look at a Pareto front between fuel burn and landing weight. So how much fuel is required to get me from point A to point B? And then once I'm at point B, you know, how much does everything weigh landing weight? So, so, that, so the trade-off between fuel burn and landing weight is not exactly the same as the trade-off between aerodynamic drag and structural weight, but they're in the same, they're in the same ballpark. So, so low fuel burn designs tend to be aerodynamically optimal and low landing weight designs tend to be more structurally optimal. So this is the compromise that we're after. And we have a multitude of constraints. I only have some listed here. And, and of the ones that I have listed here, the only one that I'm gonna emphasize are these stress and buckling constraints. We have, a, we have a series of static air elastic load cases. We have to make sure we have appropriate safety factors for stress. And we have to have appropriate safety factors for buckling. And again, buckling, and I'll, I'll emphasize this again, buckling is a big one. We really have got to have that in there or we do not get uh, meaningful results returned to us. And buckling is, you know, the computational cost of buckling is, is quite a bit higher than it is for, for stresses. Um, we, have to, we have to solve an eigen problem and we have to deal with, uh, you know, tracking of those, of those numerous eigen buckling modes across that parameter space. Um, so these are sort of the sorts of results that we get. Um, again, this is the Pareto front we're after. On the, on the y-axis, we have landing weight and on the x-axis, we have fuel burn. So, so again, you know, designs that have low fuel burn, which means they're sort of aerodynamically optimal in this area of the Pareto front tend to be a little on the heavy side. And if we go to the other side, designs that are lighter, but they have lower landing weight, tend to require more fuel to get us from point A to point B. So this is the, this is the key compromise that we're, that we're trying to, to map out across that front. I've got two curves there, uh, one in black and one in red. 
the one in black um, does include topological design variables. So we're solving all three design variable sets at once, sizing, shape, and topology. Whereas the red curve does not include topology. So we're only solving shape and sizing, and we're doing this for a frozen topology, right? We came up with some reasonable looking layout of ribs and spars and stringers, and we've frozen it, and we're only doing shape and sizing optimization. So the computational cost of the red curve is substantially less than the computational cost of the black curve, maybe about two orders of magnitude, because the red curve only requires gradient-based optimization, whereas the black curve requires this nested optimizer, where we're doing hundreds, if not thousands, of gradient-based optimizations for a single point on that Pareto front. So the computational cost differences are extreme there. So we've demonstrated that we can solve this problem, right? We have this black line where we're solving all three design variable sets at once. Um, Was well, it worth it? This is the next question we want to answer. So for the minimum fuel burn designs on this side of the plot here, we don't really see that big of a benefit um, to including layout variables, right? So those two Pareto fronts, they're not that different from one another, uh, meaning that we really could just optimize the shape and sizing variables with a frozen topology and get away with it, right? So the synergies between the three design variable sets is not that high. On the other side of the Pareto front, however, there are there is a lot of daylight between these two curves, right? So these for these minimum landing weight designs, which which tend to be not that aerodynamically optimum, but are much more structurally optimum. Here we do see a large benefit to including the layout design variable. So there are very strong synergies between the three design variable sets. If we were just to assume a frozen topology, um, which is what we do in this red curve, uh, we'd have a substantially suboptimal result. Um, so this shows some of those optimal designs across this Pareto front. Um, this is a little bit difficult to look at, so I'll, I'll walk you through it. But, but this is this design here is at the top of the Pareto front. So this is the minimum fuel burn design. And then we sweep down to this design on the bottom, which is the minimum uh, landing weight design on the other extreme of the Pareto front. What I'm showing here is a wing box, which has like been unwrapped, if you will. So on, on, this, on this right side of the plot, we have the upper skins, uh, where the color is, is the skin thickness, the optimized skin thickness. And the lines show you the imprint of the ribs and the stringers up against that skin. And then on the left plot is the lower skins, uh, which again, the color is the thickness and then the lines are the imprint of the ribs and the lower stringers. So again, this is a wing box which has been sort of unwrapped and flattened across the page. So as we move from the top to the bottom, again, we, we sweep from minimum fuel burn designs down to minimum landing weight designs. Uh, you can see that uh, there's some pretty substantial topological and shape and sizing changes across this front. Uh, in terms of, um, we have uh, uh, shorter wingspans, uh, we have more wing sweep, we have thinner skins, right? So the, the skin thickness goes down almost a minimum minimum bounds there, and we get a ton more um, stringers uh, pushed into the system. So this is sort of the, the optimal trade-off that, that, the, that the design has found as it moves across that Pareto front. Um, the last thing that we looked at for this paper was the benefits of including curved members. So the previous topologies, we were restricting ourselves to just straight ribs and just straight stringers. But, but you know, we wondered to ourselves, well, what if we allowed those members to be curved, right? So they had some curvature there. So when we only have straight ribs and stringers and, and spars, we have about 15 topological design variables. Uh, when we augment the design variable space to include curved members, now we get up to about 25 topological design variables. So recall, we're using a global optimizer for this. We're forced to. Um, if you have 25 design variables across, across a global optimization process, you're, you're really pushing it there in terms of you know, the cursive dimensionality and things like this. So 25 uh, was about as high as we could go and, and maybe even higher than we should have gone. But we did get results that seemed reasonable. Um, so this is the same Pareto front, right, between landing weight and fuel burn. I've got, again, two curves here. I've got the black curve where I'm restricting myself to straight member topologies. And this is the same Pareto front that I've repeated from a couple of slides back. Uh, and the red curve here is where we augment that topological design space to include curved member topologies, right? So, so both of these Pareto fronts include all three design variable sets, shape, sizing, and topology, um, whereas the black one, only straight members, and the red one um, allows it to be curved as well if the optimizer wants to do that. Um, you can see for the minimum landing weight designs, these two topologies are right on top of each other. There is no benefit to using curved topologies here. Uh, in the minimum fuel burn designs, the more aerodynamically optimal designs, we do see some daylight between these two Pareto fronts. So here there is some benefits to including curved topologies, at least from a physics standpoint. The question would be, could it buy its way onto the airplane, right? Because the manufacturing cost of, of uh, having a curved rib is substantially larger um, than a straight rib. So, so is, is, the, is the delta that we're seeing here in terms of fuel burn enough um, to warrant its inclusion. And, and we don't know the answer to that. We didn't make any attempt to solve that, to, to answer that question. But anyway, this is something that you should keep in the back of your mind. Um, and this shows some of those optimal designs along the Pareto front. For the curved member topologies, again, going from minimum fuel burn to minimum landing weight. Uh, we have some weirdness here where, where the optimizer sort of took advantage of us, I would say, and it came up with this, this 
dense clustering of stringers. And, and so I, I maybe I would throw out this design in your mind, but, but starting here on the second one and moving down, you can see we have some slight curvature in the stringers and the ribs, as you can see. When we get to this bottom design, and it's, it's kind of hard to see down here, pretty much everything is, is straight, right? And that's what would be expected because the optimizer doesn't see any benefit to including uh, curved members uh, at that point. Um, so that's all I have. Um, so we've shown that we can use nested procedures to capture design synergies uh, to solve this large scale MINLP problem. Uh, so, so we have a large number of shape sizing and, and topological design variables. We have a, a bi-level scheme where we have a global optimizer on the top for just the layout variables and then a, a local optimizer on the bottom for just the shape and sizing variables. This seems to work uh, fairly well. Uh, we found that for the low weight designs, right, so on one extreme of the Pareto front, we have minimum landing weight designs. These synergies really do matter, right? So, so if we just optimized with only shape and only sizing, it would give us an inferior result. We really have to include all three. On the other end of the Pareto front, the low drag designs, minimum fuel burn, more aerodynamically optimized designs, uh, the advantages are, are much, much smaller, um, but those designs on that side do benefit from the use of curved linear topologies from a pure aeroelastic physics standpoint anyway they do. Whether they could actually buy their way onto the airplane is another question. And that is all I have. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Brett, for that interesting talk. Um, so now I will invite people to ask questions. So you can either raise your hand or, or type something in the chat. Uh, if there are no immediate questions, I've scribbled down, ah, Julian. Uh, thank you for a very nice uh, presentation, Brett. I, I, I have a question. So are, are you using shell elements to model the, the stiffeners or uh, is your mesh made of shell elements? Yeah, the, the skins, the, all the webs and the skins are shell elements. The stiffeners are modeled with beams. So when you change the, for the curve uh, stiffeners design, do you have some constraints that prevent the stiffeners from kind of intersecting each other? Because I noticed, I think it was in a slide, it's like 12 that you had one design in which uh, some of, yeah, if you look at the third one uh, from the top, uh, actually from either direction, you can see that there are some um, some stiffeners that are sort of intersecting kind of halfway through. And is that is that part of the initial configuration, that intersection between the, I don't know if you can see it actually, that it's kind of halfway through the wing. You see that there yeah. are two stiffeners that seem to be intersecting. So are, are they, you know, are the, Shell mesh is actually joining there, or 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 is that not the case? I'm sorry, you're asking if the shell meshes are joining there, or so, the, or, or you? Yeah, I, I imagine when you start uh, the optimization, the the shell meshes for the stiffeners are separate, and as they start changing curvature, it looks like the stiffeners may end up intersecting each other. But that intersection may not be effective in the final element model. Right. The, right. The, the, the two shell meshes might just be sitting on top of each other, but. Right. So we actually model the, the, the stiffeners with beams. So, so this is modeled as a beam element with an eccentric offset. And so the, the thing, the worry that we have is that this flange is going to get too close to this flange. Is that what you're asking me or? Yeah, maybe I'm not interpreting this well, but, but in slide 12, as I said, you can, you can see that there are kind of two of those that intersect each other. But... I, I think it's the ribs actually, rather than the stiffness that are, that look That's like right. they're overlying. That's so right. In the third oh, okay. figure down about halfway along the wing, Right, the ribs. Yeah, the ribs do intersect each other, and that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. If the, if the optimizer wants to do that, then then we do model um, that shell on shell intersection. Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ahmad. Thank you, Brett, for your presentation. In this slide uh, example that you are showing, twelve. Do you expect to see a symmetric uh, design at the end? Based on the uh, the physics of the problem, you mean why is the right side of these plots different than the left side? Yes, yes, right. Yeah. So, so I, I didn't do a good job explaining it. So, so this is a, this is an unwrapped wing box. So that the right side is the upper skins and the left side is the lower skins. Okay. Okay. Right. So there's no reason why they should be the same. In fact, you would expect them to be quite different. Yeah. So, so I'm not trying to show the whole airplane there, and that, that's the risk when you show it like this: is people think you're showing the whole airplane from top down. What I'm showing is the lower skins unwrapped from the upper from the upper skins and flattened onto the page. All right. Okay. I got it. I got it. Thank you. Yeah. So we have like a you know we have a typically you'll have like a two and a half G you have like a pull up maneuver right and you'll have a push over maneuver and that has different requirements for the upper and lower skins so you would expect them to be different. Yeah. 
Okay, Jun, one last question before we move to the last speaker, Jun. Yes, uh, thank you for a nice presentation, Brad. Uh, I'm curious in, in this design problem, what is the, uh, the resolution, what are the number of elements involved in the calculation and uh, how long does the calculation take in total, for instance, to compute in that uh, plateau front? Does it take a few hours or a few days? Just curious. So yeah, the resolution of the fine element model, it was not a particularly fine fine element model. I'd say it's maybe 30,000 elements. So, so it could be finer. Um, and um, so, but, but in, in terms of computational cost, when we solve the bi-level scheme, each each uh, member of the uh, Pareto front takes uh, about a week. Okay. Um, and then for the, uh, let me go to this slide actually. Uh, so, so when we include all three design variable sets at once, we have to solve this bi-level scheme, that's the black curve. Each of these data points, again, it takes about a week. It's very expensive because we're doing this bi-level scheme. For the red curve, we're only doing gradient-based optimization with a frozen topology. This takes a few hours. So it's, it's, it's a computational cost difference between these two curves of, of, of about two orders of magnitude. Is there any parallelization involved? Penalization? What do you mean? Uh, uh, parallelization. Like high-performance computing, we're just using a single GPU. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Multi multiple levels of it. You know, the, the aeroelastic um, system itself is parallelized. We're doing adaptive infilling, so we, um, we we compute multiple infill points at once, all in parallel, and then we solve multiple uh, members of the Pareto front, all the you know, simultaneously in parallel. So we're we're doing as much as we can there, but but still, you can't get away from the fact that we're doing um, this right. So every time the global optimizer considers a new design, we have to do a complete gradient-based optimization under the hood, and that the computational cost is, is is enormous when you try to do that. But yes, everything is written in parallel to the best of our abilities. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Brett. Just just one comment for me on that. I, I wonder if using a surrogate model for the red box would help speed everything up. Yes. Yeah, so the problem there is we have too many we have too many shape and sizing design variables for a surrogate model to be of use to us. I think we have you know um, several hundred sizing variables and maybe on the order of twenty or thirty shape design variables. So I, you can't really fit a surrogate model to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brett. Let's thank the speaker right. again and. Um, Move on to our last speaker for today. So Julian, if you can share your screen. All right. So I'd like to introduce um, Professor Julian Narato from um, University of Connecticut, who's gonna present some recent research into that ever present problem in topology optimization, uh, stress constraints. So over to you, Julian. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the invitation. And um, uh, can you hear me well and see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, this is uh, work uh, that I uh, did while uh, doing, uh, or most of it I did while doing a, a summer faculty fellowship at the uh, Air Force Research Lab uh, in collaboration with uh, Holly Smith, who is my uh, former PhD student. He's now doing a postdoc at AFRL and Josh Deaton and, and Raymond Colonnay at AFRL. So as um, Peter just said, uh, this is a problem that uh, we keep trying to solve. It's a challenging problem in topology optimization, the stress constraint uh, optimization problem, um, where we typically try to minimize the volume or, or the mass of the structure subject to uh, constraints um, when we have uh, discretized with uh, the uh, model with a panel and mesh, we may want, for example, that the stress at every element, some measure of the stress, like from this is a stress, uh, does not exceed some specified limit. And we may want to have that for uh, multiple uh, load cases. So some of the challenges of this particular uh, problem that uh, people have studied uh, over the years and have proposed solutions to over the years are the problem of uh, singular optima, which uh, has to do with, with the fact that um, you uh, have regions of the design space that are degenerate and typically the minimum for the optimization problem may be sitting on, on a corner of that degenerate region. And people have uh, proposed more different ways of addressing that. One of them is the QP approach by uh, Matteo Brugi and the epsilon relaxation by um, actually multiple uh, multiple people. And then another important challenge is that if we have one uh, constraint per element in the panel and mesh and we wanted to impose a single constraint for each element, then we would end up obviously with a very large number of constraints. 
And so two ways to addressing that are to use a penalty or augmented Lagrangian approaches in which you essentially put all of the constraints as an added term to the objective function. And there's been quite a lot of uh, interesting work happening in that space in the last years. And the other one, which is uh, the, the one that um, uh, I've been working on since about you know, 2009, 2008, is to replace these multiple constraints with um, an aggregation function. I, I should say I'm not the only one working on who has been working on this approach. Now, um, in this work, we want to focus on this latter approach. And you know, the, the reason being that uh, it just makes it uh, easier for us to be able to impose multiple constraints in the optimization if we had other constraints. Now, when we do that, meaning when we take all the elemental constraints and replace them with a single um, maximum function, then we have some other challenges. You know, the first one being that the true maximum function is not differentiable. And so what people have proposed is to replace it with uh, a differentiable approximation of the maximum function. Actually, um, Ole and uh, Pierre Lissan were some of the first uh, people to propose that. Um, but then when you have this smooth approximation, uh, they, they are, after all, an approximation. And so then uh, if you impose the constraint directly on the smooth approximation, uh, you're not going to tightly satisfy the constraint, right? And so you end up with, uh, you know, depending on whether the approximation to the maximum approximates the maximum from above or or, or from below, uh, you may end up with a uh, a design that either violates the, the true maximum uh, limit that, that you want or that is too conservative, right? And so the um you know one of the first solutions to to this which uh, was uh, proposed by uh Chaole back in in 2010 right is to do this adaptive constraint scaling where what you do is that you modify uh the constraint and this is by the way so this is a p norm of let's say the ratio of the elemental stresses uh, divided by the stress limit corresponding to that load case right so you compute a p norm and um, if uh, all the stress constraints, let's say if, if this uh, approximation, if it was not an approximation, but it was exact, then this would be exactly equal to, to one and then your constraint would be satisfied assuming all of the stresses, of course, um, uh, do not exceed the, the stress limit. Uh, so what we do with adaptive constraint scaling is that we multiply this norm here by a factor that we essentially keep changing at every iteration, right? So if the uh, P norm is, uh, for instance, uh, if when we impose the constraint, we end up with a true max with with a true maximum stress that is below what what we want, below the limit. Then we adjust the this gamma, right? So that next time around it comes a little bit closer, and we keep essentially changing back and forth this value of gamma as the iterations go, right? Now, uh, let me note that in terms of the relaxation in our method, we use the QP approach. So what we proposed in this, um, in this paper was to uh, have another, oh, sorry, I, I missed an important point. And it is that, you know, adaptive constraint scaling, you know, we have been using it for a while, but uh, it has some difficulties. And one of them being that uh, the efficacy of that approach is very sensitive to the aggregation parameters, both in terms of you know, being able to deal with uh, different mesh sizes or, or sizes of the problem, uh, but also in terms of uh, robustness, as, as we'll see. So what we proposed uh, in this paper is uh, a different type of aggregation approach. Uh, we first start with a local stress constraint, right? And so we want for, let's say for each element, that the stress at the element, and this is already the relaxed uh, stress, uh, does not exceed the specified uh, limit, stress limit for that load case. And so we want for each element that the maximum between zero and this quantity here has to be less than, than or equal than, than zero. Um, again, uh, you know, this is not uh, differentiable, the true maximum function, so we just replace it with a smooth approximation. And um, the approximation that we started working with was the soft plus function, which is this one, and, and the equation is this. Uh, and the soft plus function is essentially the Kreisel-Meyer-Steinhauser 
uh, function just apply to zero and some number, right? Uh, and so this function, right, ideally, right, if the stress limit is um, uh, satisfied, it, it should give you zero. And if it's violated, it should give you some uh, positive number. However, the soft plus function as it is, has a small but um, nevertheless finite um, value at zero, right? And so if we use the soft plus function directly, to uh, model these local stress constraint, we would end up with a design that is very conservative, right? Because we would have designs for which uh, the stress is um, the stress constraint is satisfied for every element, right? But if it's, for example, if all the stresses are at the limit, we would still have you know some some amount here, and so uh, the constraint would push the whole thing uh, down, and so we would end up with a conservative design. So we shift the soft plus function by some specified amount by the user, by some amount epsilon, right? So that now we have something that looks like this, that it's uh, closer to zero uh, for x equals uh, to zero, right? And it cannot be exactly zero because this function is never exactly zero, right? So now we essentially have hopefully something that if the constraints are active, give us you know something very close to, to zero. Then, uh, what we would want is that the maximum local stress violation then ends up being zero, right? So again, we have this function here, right? That that uh, this rectifier, right? That um, uh, should give us zero if the individual element stress constraint is satisfied. And so we want some uh, aggregation, uh, some smooth maximum of all those uh, rectifier functions to be less than or equal than zero, right? And that smooth approximation may be something like a lower bound kreisel meyer steinhauser function. If we do this, however, uh, this approach actually does not perform very well. And it doesn't perform very well because essentially we're shooting for something that is close to zero, right? And this is smooth approximations. Actually, their, their, their performance deteriorates as you're getting uh, closer to zero. So uh, we do a couple of things to try to circumvent that. One is that instead of finding the uh, uh, smooth maximum of these rectifier functions, we try to approximate the smooth maximum of E raised to the rectifier function, right? So that now the constraint becomes that the smooth approximation minus one should be less than or equal than zero. And then we also uh, do continuation of the beta parameter uh, for the lower bound KS function. When we apply to the L bracket uh, problem, which is uh, now kind of a benchmark in the stress constraint topology optimization, uh, here we're applying it to uh, this problem with multiple mesh sizes. So this is a coarser mesh, a finer and a finer mesh. And here we have, uh, we also use different values of the aggregation parameter for the LKS function. So 12, 16, and 20, right? And these are the designs that we obtained and these are the corresponding plots for the relaxed stress. So we see here that we, you know, get for the same mesh size, we get, you know, pretty much the same uh, design, right? We also see that even for the coarse mesh, the optimizer is able to round the uh, kind of the load path around the reentrant corner, which is what we uh, would expect. And we also see that, you know, even the coarse mesh designs, uh, that all of the designs are, you know, pretty close to be uh, fully stressed, which is which is encouraging. Right? Um, now, when we look at the actual results, um, you know, these are some of the uh, volume fractions that that we have, and and I'll get back to these when we compare it to the adaptive constraint scaling approach. And also, we see that the stress constraint is either slightly violated, right? So at, at the most, one point eighty seven percent above the constraint or uh, inactive, right? So in these, uh, in all of these designs, right? Uh, we're, we're farther away from the constraint, but we are satisfying the constraint, right? We are on the inactive side. And this is what the uh, convergence uh, behavior looks like. So this is the objective function, the volume fraction uh, plotted um, in front, as a function of the iteration for all of those runs that I showed before. And we can see that all of these uh, designs satisfy the true maximum uh, stress, right? Which uh, for the LKS function that would be, uh, sorry, for the true maximum that would be when we get a one here, right? So we're satisfying the stress constraint. Now, if we 
used for the same problem, right? So same mesh size, the adaptive constraint scaling approach for different values of the p-norm, right? Six, eight, and 10. Then, you know, uh, the, the results are not as good as the ap approach that we're proposing. So for coarser meshes, right? Depending on the value of p that you have, you may not be able to get like the rounded corner, um, the rounded load path around the re-entrant corner, right? Uh, we may get kind of different designs depending on the on the mesh size. And also, you know, we not always get, uh, you know, fully stressed design, definitely not as uniformly as we did for the um, uh, maximum rectifier function approach. But also, and very interestingly, and this is something we did not expect, uh, we actually have for the adaptive constraint scaling approach, the volume fraction is in general higher and in some cases much higher than in the uh, maximum rectifier function approach. So the ACS approach is very effective in having a tight uh, constraint, right? But that comes at the expense of not necessarily having a very good uh, design, right? And when we look at the convergence, you know, clearly the convergence behavior for the adaptive constraint scaling approach is not as you know, smooth and nice as, as it was for the approach that we're proposing. And then in some cases, actually the um, optimization can kind of diverge away from the stress constraint and end up violating the stress constraint, which, which actually happens for, I think is this design up here. So for P equals six, right? And so for anyone who's toyed with, you know, P norm and adaptive constraint scaling in the past, you know that you sort of have to play with this value of P to, you know, get some reasonable results. Unfortunately, when we go to large mesh sizes, um, we start seeing a little bit more of difficulty in terms of converging to a zero one design. So this is the same L bracket problem with 102,000 elements, 160,000 elements and 250,000 elements, right? Um, interestingly, right, the convergence is still good. So when you look at the convergence plot, it still looks smooth. And the optimizer is uh, still able to satisfy the stress constraint. So we are, you know, slightly below, but in all, all cases, the constraint is inactive and it is, it is therefore satisfied, right? Um, and then you see that in some of these void regions, right, the relaxed stress is essentially coming very close to the, to the limit, uh, the stress limit for that load case, right? And so that makes us think that the problem is actually not the aggregation constraint, but the relaxation scheme, because we're seeing the aggregation constraint do a good job in terms of satisfying the stress constraint and exhibiting good, good convergence. So this is something we'd like to uh, look into um, in, in the future, because uh, we have, as, as I said, you know, kind of uh, several clues that it might be more related to the relaxation scheme. As a matter of fact, here, when you look at the densities, right, if the density is close to zero, you would expect the relaxed stress to also somewhat be close to zero, but that's not the case. And finally, I have an example uh, for a 3D cantilever beam. Uh, one thing I like about the, this example is that um, uh, that uh, we would think that uh, in this particular case, the minimum compliance design should look the same as the stress constraint design. And that's not the case because if the beam, if the beam is long enough, then essentially you have a stress concentration here, right? The, the design region really does not allow for the minimum compliance design to be the same as the strongest design, right? And so when we use the MRF approach, we get something that looks like this, right? It slightly uh, violates the stress constraint, but not by much. This is what we get with adaptive constraint scaling. Um, and this is the minimum compliance design for the same amount of volume that we get with the MRF approach, right? And so we see that, you know, already if you compare the MRF approach to the adaptive constraint scaling, we get a much more um, kind of fully stressed design, so to speak, than with the adaptive constraint scaling approach. So the adaptive constraint scaling approach is very good at, at maintaining the stress limit, right? It's very, very close to, to zero, right? but we are getting a better design. It's actually lighter and, and closer to being fully stressed. So uh, to, to conclude this, um, compared to adaptive constraint scaling, um, the approach we propose has much better convergence, is less sensitive to changes in the aggregation parameter, and produces lighter designs uh, in the majority of uh, cases that we experiment in. 
And as I said, you know, we have some difficulty in converting to zero one designs for large meshes, and that's something that we'd like to uh, revisit in the in the future. And one nice thing about this MRF approach that I didn't put in the conclusions, but but uh, I'd like to say is that um, it can be used uh, for level set methods. So just like we've done adaptive constraint scaling uh, for level set methods, for instance, in, a, in our in our collaboration with with Alicia Kim, right? This MRF approach could also be used for level set methods, and it could also be used for um, other uh, kind of uh, functions like fatigue, right? So thank you very much, and and the the code for this approach by the way is available through github if, if you're interested so um yeah i'm happy to take any questions okay thank you julian so we have time for a few questions Ahmad, thank you julian uh, for nice presentation in your method you had a epsilon shifting parameter that yeah. you said it is a user defined how you're selecting that and how your solution is uh, sensitive to this, the final solution that you are getting. So uh, we we just experimented with it numerically. And I, I forget what was the value that we used. I think it ended up being something like one in negative three or something like that. And I can, I can check later, um, but it, it was just numerical experimentation. If you make it too large, right? Then the epsilon shifted function ends up being like the original soft plus, right? And so you end up with a conservative design. Um, if you make it too small, right, the, the epsilon, then the maximum function, you know, starts, you know, performing worse because you're you're getting closer and closer to zero. So um, it was, it was uh, just really a matter of experimentation. Uh, but that being said, once we found a value for that parameter, it seems to work well across all of the examples and all of the mesh sizes and so on. So we didn't have to change it uh, for all of the examples that that we run in the in the paper. Okay, just a, a follow up question, if may I have? Uh, you compared with the aggregated method and uh, the the performance of the the your design, the volume fraction, and stress. What about the, um, the computational cost? Have you a comparison between uh, when you are using aggregate or you are using this? Uh, I forgot what how you are calling this method. So uh, with this, what was the time-wise efficiency? Uh, it's it's fairly similar. It's fairly similar. So um, you know, in in there will be times when the ACS method will do just a little faster. But I mean, we're talking about maybe like 150 iterations versus 200 iterations, right? So the cost is fairly uh, fairly comparable. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Matthias. Yeah, thanks, Julian, for the talk. Interesting, uh, different uh, approach. Uh, I had a question triggered by, I think, the slide 10 or 11. You show the convergence plot of the adaptive constraint scaling, and it looks uh, yeah, pretty uh, jittery. So are you updating the, the scaling parameter in every iteration, or do you use a different right. update scheme? Right, right. So we, we uh, in adaptive constraint scaling, we are modifying this gamma at every iteration based on the value of the true maximum stress in the previous iteration. I see. So in my experience, it can really help if to not do it in every iteration, because then actually the optimizer is all the time chasing a moving target. So right. uh, yeah, your sensitivities are never, never predicting the actual situation you will get in the next step. So it could work better if you do it every 10 or 20 uh, iterations or so. At least that's my experience. Yeah, I thank you, and, and that's that's a good suggestion. I I think that would that would help smoothing out the convergence, right? But it may still not necessarily help with the sensitivity to the values of the parameter of the aggregation, and it may still give us it may still give us suboptimal designs, right? So we are getting better designs with MRF. It's possible that if we sort of um, try to control that change in in the in the parameter gamma, we'll get a smoother convergence. But I don't. Think it would necessarily work better here yeah, yeah I, I don't know either that's yeah yeah indeed thanks so john yeah thank you for a nice presentation junior uh, i have a question about the 3d results which is on page 13 
Yes. If I compare the three results from the left to the right side, the, the results MRF, they have primarily some kind of beam-like structures, while the other two, they have more shell structures. Um, could you explain why this is the case? Um, so I can say that for the minimum compliance design, uh, it does make sense to have more of a box structure because it gives you more uh, momentary of inertia, right? So your stiffness increases. Um, as for the difference between the MRF and the ACS, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, uh, um, you know, I, I think this is a byproduct of all the, uh, the, uh, you know, it, it could, uh, it could really be just a convergence to a local minimum or or something of that sort. But I don't really know. It's clear to me why we're getting this one, right? It's not entirely clear to me why, um, you know, we're we're getting this particular one for the ACS approach, right? Um, it could be just, you know, the optimizer followed a path, right? Obviously, it's still doing, you know, significantly better in terms of stresses than the minimum compliance design for yes. the same amount of material, right? So it is, it is still somewhat working, right? I mean, the stress limit is satisfied, right? Very well, right? And um, and so um, I think it's just a different local minimum. But the the MRF approach, obviously, you know, that's um, significantly better in terms of getting a more um, fully stressed design, right? You also have more beams. I'm wondering, have you um, tested on different 3D geometry? I'm just uh, curious whether you will get more beam-like structure with this approach or not. I'm just purely from a no, geometry and, perspective. And actually, and, and actually, I just realized uh, something else, June, which is that this mesh has something like 80,000 elements. Okay. So it's possible that the resolution of the mesh is not good enough to capture like thin thin members, right, or thinner members. So there is a possibility that if, you know, if if we uh, had a much finer mesh that you would start seeing, you know, more plate-like structures, right? So it may just be completely just the resolution of the of the mesh. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, time for one last question from, from Ole. Uh, thank you, Julian, for an interesting talk. Uh, so just first a comment to the June's questions. I, if you have some grayscale in there, I think maybe the results are not so reliable. As you pointed out, you had it with the 2D results for finer meshes. So that could be part of the reason for the changes in topologies, is my guess. Mm -hmm. uh, the question I had was uh, that both uh, we, so we work with Gustavo Silva and also Paulino, sort of have converged towards augmented Lagrangian approaches instead of uh, these uh, norm approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see your approach? For me, it's a little bit like it's in between. And also, did you compare to some of the augmented Lagrangian approaches? So, you know, one, one of the motivations for us to keep looking at aggregation is the ability to treat the constraints separately in the optimizer, right? To pass them as a separate constraint uh, to a to a constraint opt, uh, to to a, an optimizer that takes um, that solves constraint problems, right? Uh, because when you start adding, you know, not only stress constraints but other types of constraints, then it's possible that some of these penalty and augmented Lagrangian approaches might, you know, might get a little trickier in terms of uh, juggling the relative values of the penalty parameters or the Lagrange multipliers so that the method works well, right? And there is some preliminary evidence to that. There is a paper by Ross and, and Weisman at, at Columbia uh, where they looked at, you know, having a, uh, they actually had, um, I, believe, I forget if it was a penalty or an augmented Lagrangian approach, but they had stress and fatigue constraints, right? And, uh, you know, they sort of had to play with the, with the penalty parameters. So, um, the the motivation for us, as I said, is to still be able to pass the stress constraint as a separate constraint to the optimizer, still, you know, being able to solve it with a sort of black box constraint optimizer and not have to deal with that problem of figuring out the good relative values for the penalty parameters. 
Okay, I, I think in our latest where we've compared the two, Nils should co correct me if I'm wrong, but I we put it also on top of MMA, the, the augmented Lagrangian, and we made it work pretty consistently for many different cases. But okay, but anyway, there's there are still headaches with these stress constraints. I fully agree. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so, okay. Sorry. Sorry, Julian. If you want to, one last final word. Yeah. So, uh, so I think if if one thing is to have like stress constraints for multiple uh, load cases, I think I was thinking more about having stress constraints and fatigue constraints, because you know the relative magnitudes of those may be fairly different, right? And and so that's that's where things may get a little bit more challenging. But I, you know. I'm, I'm sure there are ways in which you can get penalty and augmented Lagrangian methods to work robustly in those instances. Um, but you know, you you have to be careful. I think either way, I think there, there's never a free lunch, right? You always find find something um, that that could be problematic. Yeah. Okay, so we are at the the end. Um, I was hoping to leave a little bit of time for general questions to the speakers, but um, as always, I'm sure speakers will, will welcome uh, questions by email or by other means. Um, so it just remains for me to, to thank all the speakers, one Mehdi, um, to Brett and to Julian. Um, and thanks to the organizers for, for putting this all together. And I'll hand, hand back to Jun for a final word. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. And uh, Peter, thank you for organizing the session. Next session will be on 23rd of March, and I look forward to seeing many of you there. Have a nice day, well, nice.